Yep, good afternoon now, everyone. Welcome to this webinar where we're going to have a, a, a bit of an introduction to industrial robots and industrial robots safety. Um, my name's Dean. I'm, the, I'm, I'm a senior consultant for, senior safety consultant for Pills Australia here in New South Wales. Um, I have been uh, involved and um, integrating robots and robotic systems um, well, for about 10 years now. Um, but we'll get started. Um, what is a robot? A little bit of a, little you bit of a, a, we can't a, see a screen, definition, mate. one from the Oxford Dictionary. Um, pretty much, hey, Dean. Uh, you Dean. Know, as you can see, summarise it. Um, programmable, oftentimes single axis, multi axis, four axis, Dean. six axis, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, hey, Dean. Sorry, I've got. Um, Can't see your screen, mate. Oh. Terribly sorry. Got that now? Yep, yep, yep. There now. All right. Yeah. So a bit of a bit of a bit of a um, couple of definitions. Um, programmable, single axis, multi axis, um, automatic operation as such. Um, some of the different kinds of robots we look at and um, are concerned with when we're talking about uh, industrial robot safety. Um, portal robot, um, we have a SCARA robot, so you may or may not know SCARA robots are typically two axis robots, X and Y, um, oftentimes or normally rigid in the, in the Z direction. Um, so, you know, it can be used, um, can be used in assembly applications typically. Articulated robot, the one we've all we've all seen throughout factories everywhere. So um, you know, some people might call them Cartesian robots if you're using if you're using a four-axis robot or articulated for a six-axis robot. Hexapod robot, um, usually usually a, a larger footprint, but again designed to be uh, to have quicker quicker output on the servo motors. Um, oftentimes you'll see these in, in pick place applications where, where you need a high cycle time or a, 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 you have a high rate of, um, of movement. Movable robot. Um, and the interesting one, um, everyone wants to know about the, the collaborative robot. Um, so uses of use use of robotics or robots is on the increase. Yep, we um, we rely on these things for high productivity. Um, good to use in hazardous areas, areas where we don't necessarily want um, want human interactions, welding, painting. But although we are we are generally utilizing and introducing these these robots um, into our applications, um, they, they do introduce a number of risks, a number of hazards, um, you know, a couple of examples there. Moving, can move unexpectedly. Um, movements will generally cause injuries if, if not guarded, safeguarded. Crushing, crushing piercing, trapping. Um, Good thing to mention and be be aware of, or we may all be aware of already, but ro robots are often supplied from the manufacturer. They don't have uh, safeguarding measures as such um, to protect persons in, 
in the application protect persons interacting with the robot. Um, systems integrator, the person integrating, installing, programming um, the robot application, oftentimes is responsible for for safety and the safe guarding and safety measures we implement with our robot application. Um, but the end user also has responsibility for, for safety of the application, whether that's maintaining the safety measures or safeguarding measures the, the system integrator implements, or um, something as simple as, you know, ensuring that a risk assessment is, is done on the, on the application. Um, some tasks and interactions for the robot cell um, or our robot applications, you know, not limited to, of course, loading, unloading, um, maintenance, teaching, verification. Uh, a little bit of an overview of the standards. Uh, we won't we won't really go into them too much, but there's our part one, part two, part three. Part one being our you know, sort of mandatory standards or, or general standards for use on all of all of our types of machines, from risk assessments to to the use of fixed guards, interlock guards, um, stuff like that. Then our technical support standards. We will look at general aspects of of particular um, safeguarding solutions, whether that's two hand controls, approach speeds, um, as well as our light curtains. Um, as well and and the distance associated with those things, stop time measurement, stuff like that. Um, where our robot standard sort of sits in 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 this um, in this um, part is is our part three. So our machine specific standards um, standards developed for a particular uh, machine type. So. So you can see a couple there, some mechanical power presses, hydraulic power presses, of course, our industrial robots <clears throat> and our robot systems and integration. Um, so here in Australia, we are concerned with 402.43301, which is our part one standard for our industrial robots. Um, safety requirements so there is it's 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 taken from the iso um standard 10218 part one um really i like to i like to summarize this standard as um the standard that they really they really use for the manufacturer of the robot so your basic safety requirements um for the robot itself as well as the control system attached to that robot um, but also important to to point out, it 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 looks at the requirements for the inherent safe design measures, protective measures, as well. Um, also, the information for use for our robot system, what 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 that needs to be, what that needs to look like. Um, there are some exclusions, non industrial robots, stuff like that. Um, but some of the other things this standard really talks about, which which are important, um, you know, the safe design, protective measures, gives a bit of an outline of some basic hazards associated with our robots. Um, but then also goes in to talk about the stopping functions, um, what they need to be, what they need to look like. Um, talk about the different types of safety related stop functions, whether that's emergency stop, protective stop, um, goes into talk about very important things like access limiting, how we do the access limiting, uh, the fact that we need to limit the axes. And 402.43302, which is um, taken from the ISO standard 10218 part two, which again, I like to summarize as our, our standard which our robot standard, which is really um, developed for, I, I like to say, the the system integrators who are actually putting these robots uh, um, in place in in a in an application. So um, more more directed at the integrator. Some things like um, the safety requirements, 
for the for robot robot cell um but also you know requirements around again access limiting um performance level requirements for our safety related parts associated with our robots Now, some definitions and um, quite important definitions when we're looking at our robot applications. Um, space, you know, the three-dimensional volume encompassing the movements of the robots, all their axes, um, as well as the tooling and end effectors we, we, we choose to use with our robot applications. Um, the maximum space, so the maximum design movements um, of our robot um all the axes the maximum movements maximum reach including as i said the tools end effector may need to include uh some sort of workpiece that is attached to those tools or end effectors as well um but this maximum space could also um you know from from our manufacturer could be limited by mechanical stops so we would need to to ensure, um, you know, it takes into account those mechanical stops as well. Restricted space, um, another very important one. There's, uh, I mean, I, I see um, a lot of the time when we're looking at these applications, um, the systems integrator doesn't um, adequately restrict the space on a robot. So um, it's really the, the, we're we're restricting the robot to be within the the working area of 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 our um, cell, for example. So um, we're using some sort of limiting device limiting devices, whether that's mechanical or, or um, software limits. We'll talk about a little bit further. You can have safe software limits. Um, but really, you know, if you if you picture our robot cell, it's surrounded by by guarding, fixed guarding, or or perimeter distance guarding, um, you know, you need to restrict the space of the robot to be within that, that cell um, working area, for example. But it's just important to note, you know, you need to, you need to have a restricted space with your robot, um, you know, because if, you, if you're installing a robot system, it's great, you put, you put guards in there, you put um, interlocked access, maybe light curtains, but if you don't um, adequately and, and properly restrict the space, you know, these things may be rendered ineffective, um, essentially. Operating space, um, again, is, is the actual space um, or, or the task space. So, so the area in which um, the area of the overall um, space or movement of the robot, we're actually performing a task. Um, usually, usually this operating space is controlled and limited by could be a could be a PLC communicating with our robot, could be within the robot control or the robot um, software itself. Um, but you know it's our it's our sort of task area. Um, and we have a common collaborative workspace. So workspace within a safeguarded space. So if, if for anyone out there, when we're talking about the safeguarded space, if you haven't heard that before, is 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 our space, you know, within or or within an area where we provide you know, these sorts of guards, light curtains, whatever they may be. Um, it's the space in which we have provided, you know safeguarding solutions um but in our in our common collaborative workspace um you know the human can perform tasks uh during production and operation um but you know there is additional requirements which aren't mentioned here um we don't really mention them in this webinar but um th there's additional safety measures that need to be in place whether that's um speed safe speed limiting um safe torque limiting for example um as well as other you know maybe you have a in this picture you have a um 
a safety matter or light curtain ensuring that the robot changes um, safety measures within itself to make sure that there's no contact with the human, for example. Uh, we need to be monitoring these things. Um, a little bit of relationship, um, the standards, protective devices, um, all associated with our with our um, systems integrator standard, as I like to call it, 4024-3302. Um, and again, a little bit more of a of an overview again with our standards. So the correlation between you know we have we have multiple standards we need to we need to be aware of whether that's our robot standard our standards for our 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 guards our light curtains we may have a conveyor for example that's another type c standard we need to be aware of when we're bringing these um, systems together but there is a there, there is another handy standard that we that, that we have access to in the ISO world, um, triple one six one, which is our integrated manufacturing system. So, this this standard will talk about um, task zones um, requirements where we do have you know multiple robots working in a in a common space. Um, risk assessment, of course, very important. Um, when we are integrating, designing um, industrial robot applications, um, we really, really, really need to, to do a final risk assessment. Uh, very important, capture all the hazards, um, do a bit of a risk estimation. Are we happy with these things? Um, but as any other risk assessment that we do, our robot application risk assessment, we need to look at the intended use, well, the use limits, um, teaching, maintenance, setting, cleaning, how often we are um, interacting with our robot application or our robot cell. Uh, the big one, unexpected startup, we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, access by personnel or directions, the course reasonably foreseeable misuse, what effect a failure in our control system will have. Um, you know that's where we may we may be relying on our on our spaces that we have set up. We have a we have a um, an operating space. What happens if we what happens if we make a mistake in our in our program for our robot, um, ensuring that maybe we had a, a restricted space, a safety a, a safely established restricted space. Um, to ensure that this failure doesn't doesn't cause a hazardous situation, um, our specific robot applications, welding, painting, whatever they may be, some of the hazards that that come with those sorts of applications. And of course, we can look at four hundred two four twelve oh one for guidance in performing a general risk assessment. Um, As identification, um, we need to look at all the hazards present on our robot applications. Of course, um, we have high energy, fast movements, high inertia. Um, the, the movements and initiation of movements within our robot applications, um, for someone who doesn't maybe understand it, could be difficult to predict. Um, there's also many um, triggers and initiation of movement whether that's from um, you know other other machines or other interfaces with our robot applications, so it's very hard to predict the movement. Um, if we have an overlap in our operating space, um, maybe we have two robots working in the one area um, or other machines. We have interactions with machines in our in our robot application that can create a hazard. Um, a little bit of an overview, so me some mechanical hazards, unexpected movements, again, that's that's what I think is the big one with our robot applications is unexpected startup, unexpected movements. Um, 
sharing between moving parts, trapping between the robot and the fencing, ejector materials. Of course, we need to capture our electrical hazards associated with our robot applications. If applicable, maybe some hot surfaces, noise, vibration. Now, there is a, there is a list um, in both Annex A's of 3301 and 3302, which gives give a little bit more information around the hazard identification, what sort of hazards we need to be aware of and what sort of hazards we need to identify. Uh, main impact hazards, play this video quickly. Of course, the big one, you know, if you were to access a robot area and um, the robot was to start or move, it's going to be pretty hard to get out of the way. Um, impact hazards being being the big one. Um, we need to look at um, operator and minor maintenance activities. Obviously, these things can be foreseeable. Um, you know, we when we when we design these industrial robot applications, we we should have an understanding of of the operator interactions, what minor maintenance or cleaning, for example, maybe um, is is intended for our application. Um, normally, we're looking at one person accessing the cell during a, these these operation and minor maintenance tasks. Um, but some of the hazards involved, um, non-existing or unsuitable operator access, maybe we don't have sufficient safeguarding measures in place. Um, insufficient stop function when accessing the cell, maybe our interlock doors or light curtains don't function or we don't have the correct um, safety distance associated with our ESPEs for, for a correct stop time of our robot. Um, operator openings for loading and unloading. Um, not all motions are switched off. Maybe there's other machines, and even we can talk about the end effector associated with the robot, um, you know, ensuring that these things are um, directly controlled by our safety system associated with our robot, particularly if we're in the same area. Um, again, like I said, to me, I think the biggest risk well, the, the biggest risk that I see with with um, robot applications um, is we'll have a look at now. Obviously, our our operator or maintenance person um, has walked into the or walked to the robot cell. Um, a bit of a palletizing application. We have safeguarding solutions in place. We have we have guarding, we have light curtains, we have an interlocked access door, um, and he's well. This person has has stopped the robot for access. So really, we're talking about unexpected startup um, in these minor maintenance activities where the interaction. Um, I like to call them well, not not intrusive, but you know minor intrusive activities associated with our robot cell um yeah someone has to go in the area maybe as we saw before um a product has fallen off the 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 gripper or the tool so we need someone to go in there and and fix that up so really looking at um unexpected startup We're, we're relying on our safeguarding measures to prevent unexpected startup here, so our interlocked access door. So we we also don't really have sufficient uh, visibility of the danger zone here. So the second person has 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 come in and said, "Hey, why is this robot cell stopped? Um, I'm going to try and restart it." I mean, there was there was other issues that. With, with that application as well. So, you know, when we look at this, the door, the access door shouldn't um, shut on its own weight. Um,
but these these type these types of scenarios are, are quite common um, with our robot applications. Um, so typically, you know, we could have multiple people involved with our uh, minor maintenance or operation activities. Um, insufficient detection capabilities, um, whether that's detection inside our our safeguarded area, or that's um, yeah, sorry, insufficient detection capabilities inside the safeguarded area, um, insufficient visibility. So where that video showed the second person um, providing a, a reset or restart command. You know, the, the electrical panel was in the way, so we couldn't we couldn't see what was happening necessarily behind there. There was, there was blind spots. Another one, if we have multiple access points, um, we have an access door, we have a light curtain, someone may enter through the light curtain, whether that's the right or wrong thing to do. Um, it creates an instance where there could be unexpected startup in conjunction with our lack of admin procedures. You know, maybe we had some admin procedures to ensure that the person checked the area before before we restarted. <clears throat> um, now our maintenance activities. Um, our equipment is un, is not predictable. Um, we can have a release of maybe stored energy, if, for instance, the the break of the of the robot arm or compressed air, maybe. Um, we can have erupt stops. Energies might be stored. Um, we do have multiple people typically involved with fault finding, repairing. Um, in these scenarios, maintenance, our, our more, I, I mean, I, I like to say more intrusive maintenance activities, we do have a level of admin, administrative procedures involved. So whether that's a lockout tagout procedure, um, ensuring, you know, release of stored energy, proper proper isolation as well. Now our tooling, our tooling specific hazards, so um, tools or end effectors, grippers, what clamps, whatever, whatever you want to call them. Um, very important that they are integrated into the robot safety control system, safety related parts control system um, to ensure that our safeguarding measures and safeguarding solutions stop um, stop the movements or or um, stop the energy. But with these types of tools and end effectors, we have an unexpected startup, maybe from an activation of a sensor. Typically, it's some sort of clamping tool. Uh, if we activate the sensor, we, the, the robot thinks that there's there's something to pick up. Um, typically, there will be some sort of stored energy if we're looking at pneumatic actuators. But also another big one, you know, if we are looking at um, if we are looking at controlling the energy to our to our end effectors, when we are, for instance, um, entering a, an interlocked guard for a cell, you know, what happens if we're using vacuum grippers, for example, making sure we're not dropping the product or making sure that the robot finishes its cycle, puts the product down before we allow entry maybe. So making sure that we are capturing the hazards involved with the loss of energy. It may be, it may be all good and well to, to release energy, but are we going to introduce hazards doing that? Um, a big one as well, teaching or process observation. Um, so probably not an everyday or operation occurrence, but where there is a need for close proximity work or tasks to be performed to the robot, um, we may have machine actuators or the robot actuators available or on, maybe for setup, commissioning, program verification. Maybe we want to check. Um, we've introduced maybe a new user frame to our to our robot system and we want to ensure that those things are correct before we start operation. Um, but, you know, there are there are things that we can do. I will talk about it a little bit further, um, but, you know, that's where your teacher pendant comes into it. 
um, typically will fall on your robot manufacturer. Um, you know, you'll have distinguish, um, distinguishing between your robot stop functions, emergency stop. You know, you can't use the, the, the teach pendant, but if you enter through your access door, maybe you allow the, the operator or the, um, or the I don't know, maintenance technical person to use the teach pendant. Um, this will involve um, a safety rated function within the robot, safe speed limiting. Um, and if you have a look at 3301, there's, there's some more information around, you know, in this mode of teaching, you know, you're limited to 250 millimeters per second um, linear robot speed. Um, now we're looking at our integrated manufacturing systems. So we we have we have uh, more than one robot typically working in a in a coordinated manner. Maybe they are they're doing a task together, doing different tasks within the same cell. Um, there could be other machines as well associated. Again, that's where we talk about our um, integrated manufacturing system standard triple one six one. We look at task zones um specific limits that need to be in place as well as our restricted spaces operating spaces we talked about before um there may be different safeguarding measures in place for different task zones um and our span of controls again our e-stop is a big one you know what what parts of our integrated manufacturing systems does our e-stop affect is there is there differences between our emergency stops in that area um, as well as our resets um, so a bit of a summary for our robot specific hazards um, unexpected movements collision with operator typically this will be due to incomplete, inadequate lockout or our safeguarding solutions. Um, unloading, loading or unloading parts, minor repairs, trapping between robot and fencing or machine frame, if not designed and installed correctly, um, stored energy, unstopped movements associated again with our tooling or conveyors. Maybe we haven't we haven't designed and installed, commissioned our safety system correctly. And, um, you know, we're stopping the robot, but we're not stopping the tooling or any other associated equipment. And again, I think the big one, unexpected startup. How are we detecting people in the danger zone? Are there blind spots? Do we need special reset procedures? Do we need to detect that person in the area safely? Um, and our in, uh, inadequate zoning or a safety solution for multiple robot cells. Um, now, risk reduction. Um, again, when we identify hazards, we estimate the risk. We need to provide um, effective risk reduction measures and some risk reduction factors. Um, now, some of them are listed here to eliminate the hazards and, reduction, and reduce our risk. Um, Maybe we have a nice scale layout, need for clearances, traffic flow. Typically with our robot applications, you know, you may have a load unload point where you need some um, a forklift to interact. What sort of manual intervention? Um, loading, unloading, location of our guarding, emergency stops, the requirements for our enabling devices as well. Now our risk reduction hierarchy um, from 4024-1201, our risk assessment standard, may or may not have seen this, but uh, important to follow our risk reduction hierarchy. So step one, risk reduction by inherit safe design measures. Um, you know, can we, can we change the design? Can we eliminate the hazard? Risk reduction by safeguarding. So that's where we look at our engineering controls, um, whether that is, you know, fixed guarding itself, interlocked access, enabling devices, um, light curtains, et cetera. 
um, as well as complementary. So when we talk about complementary protective measures, we're talking, um, you know, not limited to e-stops, but e-stops, maybe we have a complementary measure as a escape release. If someone was trapped inside the cell. Um, but really our engineering measures, step two. Um, and step three, information for use whether that's warning signs, training, PPE. Um, but it's important to, to note that you really need to follow this hierarchy for effective risk reduction. So step one, we want to reduce um, or re reduce the risk associated by inherently safe design. Not always possible, but, but that's our step one, engineering and then information for use. Um, a little bit of an example. So in this in this scenario, we have you know a robot. A person could walk in a passageway. Um, maybe we have some guarding, but the guarding isn't capable of containing the full robot movement. Um, in a way that you know maybe that guarding isn't capable of withstanding the force of the robot movement. Sorry. So. Um, we could put some mechanical stops, attach them to the robot, and or re and as well, sorry, reinforce the guarding to prevent the robot from knocking the the guarding over and and crushing the person or impacting the person. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in this scenario, um, your your reinforced guarding could really fall, up, fall under our step two engineering control. Um, so it, it can sort of qualify for both in this, in this regard. Another scenario we have, we have an operator um, entering the robot space here. Maybe they are placing a, a box or some sort of product. Now, you know, how are we going to, Maybe we we substitute and we put a um, oh, sorry we eliminate the need for for the operator to enter the area, um, and we put a loading conveyor. Remove the need for the operator to enter the area. Um, we've reduced we've reduced the risk involved. You know, there's probably going to be some sort of risk involved with the conveyor itself. We need to make sure that is is properly guarded, um, but you know it's 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 a method of elimination or substitution. Engineering controls, as as we talked about, step two, um, safeguards and safeguarding measures. We have guarding, interlocks, present sensing, two hand control maybe. But another big one, the software-related safety functions associated with our robot. I mean, these these solutions are going to be um, provided by the robot manufacturer sometimes. Um, or sorry, oh, they will be um, all of the time. But there is some options that we that we may need to to say that we want with our robot based on maybe the risk assessment. Um, our, our engineering solutions or our safeguarding solutions typically act automatically. So no, no action from the personnel to prevent injury. We're designing and installing these things um, to protect the persons. Um, two types of safeguards. Um, when, I, when we talk about safeguards and safeguarding solutions, guards and protective devices. Um, so a guard, just a physical barrier. Um, to provide protection and protective devices, <laughs> safeguard other than a guard. So it's a nice one there. Um, light curtains, software rated functions, interlock devices. <clears throat> and step three, inform the user, take organizational actions. Um, maybe we have some warning signs. Yeah, warning signs. Um, making sure people are aware of the hazard. We have some training involved as well, training people, as well as our PPE.
Um, additional precautions, so where we talked about complementary protective measures, um, we we should all know emergency stops are complementary protective measures. We, we're, we're looking at 4024-1604, which is our standard for those. Um, but another measure that, that is considered complementary, um, which is often forgotten about, is our, is our escape and rescue of trapped persons as well. So you may have a, a method of escape inside the, the robot cell. Maybe that's an, uh, a, an escape release on, a, on an interlock guard, for example. Could be a complementary protective measure. We're not relying on these things to protect persons in normal operation, but in the instance that someone was trapped inside the robot cell, um, you know, we want to give them a, a means to escape. Again, really technically fits under or fits in in, in our uh, step two or engineering controls, but they are um, defined as complementary. They're not, they're not a primary protection measure. Um, people specific tasks who must be protected, not only the people interacting with the robot and the robot self itself, um, people not working. So people could be walking past, um, you know, whoever that might be. Of course, our people who operate and control the robot, maintenance personnel again, and persons calibrating and testing. So it's 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 good to understand. We need to understand that you know, the, the hazards and risks involved with our robot applications is going to differ between the people who we identify are going to be interacting with our with our robot application. Of course, Maintenance personnel, for example, are going to have a, a different set of hazards and risks associated with their tasks with the robot cell than someone who is walking by or not working with the robot. Um, robots, industrial robots and robot cells, um, we, we can have two types of protection measures and features. So we can talk about external or um, internal integrated safety features. Um, so our external safety features, um, typically from the systems integrator, can be, can be implemented. Things like e-stops, safeguards as well, doors, light curtains, interlock devices, safe access cam, mechanical limiting devices. Now, it's important, I think we, we mentioned it earlier, but when we when we talk about our robot applications, when we are looking at safety functions and safety features uh, associated with our robot, we have a minimum requirement, category three performance level D. So we can't, we can't um, try and get away with CAT2 PLD. However, someone may, may try and do that, but we need to have an integrity cat three PLD um, minimum. Of course, we need to do a risk assessment. Yeah, um, it's good to mention that we we still need to do a risk assessment, and you know those those requirements may be higher based on the the risk estimation, but minimum cat three PLD. Um, internal robot safety features as well will oftentimes be offered by the manufacturer. Um, they also they also have a, a, a minimum requirement of CAT3 PLD. Uh, you know, you will typically get your e-stop and protective stop as standard with the robot. So your emergency stop will come standard. You hit the e-stop, it stops the robot completely. Um, but you also have protective stop as well. And they like to say, well, they like to differentiate these between our, our e-stop and our safeguarding interface. So, you know, we could have it that we protective stop the robot when we enter through an interlocked access door, but we still allow the use of the teach pendant, for example. Whereas in the emergency stop situation, the teach pendant is rendered ineffective. Um, enabling devices, safe workspace or safe space, again, these ones now that we're talking about oftentimes are not standard from the robot manufacturer. You'll have to tell um, whoever it may be, KUKA, FANUK, ABB, that you want to include these functions. 
Um, safe limited position, limited force, speed. Um, and a little bit of a of a correlation between them. So, you know, where we talked about restricting our our space or restricting our robot space, um, you know, we could use mechanical limiting devices or safe access cam, or we can use the internal safety feature within the robot to use safe software limits to ensure we establish our restricted space. <clears throat> Um, persons working near the vicinity, near, oh, sorry, in the vicinity, um, maybe people who work near the machine but not with it, operators of adjacent or other machines, cleaning staff, visitors. We're really in these scenarios um, achieving our protection goals by preventing access permanently, um, using our safeguarding solutions, guards, interlocks, stuff like that. We want to prevent access from anyone just walking in there. Um, we also want to make sure we retain our robot, again, restricting the robot space, retaining the robot within our safeguarding area or our safeguarded area, as well as our tools, any materials that could be ejected. <clears throat> um, Main protection by barriers and guards, of course, prevents access to the hazardous space or our robot area. Um, they should prevent persons from ejected parts. So, you know, you wouldn't use this type of mesh guarding if you had a, uh, uh, a welding robot, for example. Um, there is requirements around uh, um, openings, but some other devices that we can use. Um, <clears throat> restricted area. So, again, our, our one of the spaces that we looked at um, at the start of the webinar was our restricted area or restricted space. Um, so, um, should be set up to restrict the robot from areas where personnel frequent presence, so our passageway, for example. Um, we, we will need to provide additional protection against incorrect movements of the robot. Um, we need to ensure that our restricted area or our restricted space restricts the robot, but also the end effectors and any work pieces or material that could be attached to our end effector. Um, now, it's good to mention, I mean, I, I like to sort of explain it like this. If you look at this picture here, your restricted space obviously needs to be within your safeguarded space, but you make you want to make sure that you restrict your space sufficiently so your safeguarding solutions in this scenario, your guards are providing adequate protection. So where we need to look at distance from our guards to our protect or to our robot, for example, what distance does that need to be? If you don't set up a restricted space, you can't you can't really gauge what that distance needs to be. So your restricted space is really um, helping you with your safeguarding, um, ensuring you know you have a, a safely limited area where you can ensure that there'll be no robot movement. Again, typically we can use our safe rated soft access limiting within the robot safe access cam monitors, but also you may, you may, or depending on the application, you may be able to use um, mechanical limiting devices. So convention of um, safeguarding, so reasonably foreseeable misuse. Um, there is a procedure mentioned in 402.4.16.02 some basic measures um, as a minimum, proper arrangement and fastening of our position switches, making sure you know you're using all the all the fixing points. Um, you can't you need a tool to remove these things. Um, force opening of locking, you know if if you're going to force the locking device, if you have a locking device associated with an interlock guard, um, it must lead to damage or equivalent time consuming measures. so. You know, if you had an interlock device that had a manual override, making sure that 
provides a stop to the system, um, someone needs to come out and and reset that device. And they're usually they're usually like a security key or a security bit or something like that. Um, and the device must be selected so they can withstand the expected forces. If there is a motivation to defeat um, our safeguarding, additional measures for interlocking, um, design measures, ensure an easy fault-free operation of the machine. So ensuring that our, our robot solution you know, isn't continuously dropping boxes, for example, if it's a palletizing robot, um, making sure we don't introduce that um, introduce that um, enticement for the for the operator to try and you know maybe reach under the guard or climb over, for example, um, and provide alternative modes of operation for setting tool change process observation. You know, give the operators of this of this equipment and the robot cells. Um, the right operating modes and, and safe operating modes if they do need to do um, intrusive tasks or modify certain things um, within the process. Um, reset or acknowledgement. Um, so we, again, our unexpected startup associated with our robot cells, um, we need to provide uh, measures to prevent the restart of hazardous movement while there are people within the hazardous area. Um, two cases, so dangerous area is visible, clearly, or dangerous area is invisible. So with our clearly visible dangerous or hazardous area, um, you know, from our reset location, maybe we have a reset location for our interlock guard, um, the person resetting that, that, that device needs to be able to see the entire hazardous area it needs to be clear view. The reset button, of course, needs to be outside of the perimeter guarding. Um, and we can't have our reset reachable from the inside so that you can stand inside and, and reset. Pretty self explanatory. Um, dangerous area is invisible. Um, now we have our reset location. Maybe you can't see the hazardous area, or maybe there is. Um, a lot of blind spots where people could be crouching down, for example, behind a, a conveyor. Um, maybe you want to have um, additional resets. Um, maybe you have a reset inside that needs to be pressed. Then you can press the second reset. That will be a timed process. Um, key systems, and we may need to add additional det detection inside the cell. Um, we can create a handover window um, for our robot interaction tasks. Robot could move automatically inside the safeguarded space. We have a window where the we'd operator hands maybe material to the robot, um, and we still in automatic operation. But we need to provide additional safeguarding measures. So, fixed guards or sensitive guards. We're going to have to just provide some sort of safe, safe reduced speed near the window, um, ensure that we, we are monitoring the position of the tool maybe to make sure we're not crushing. Lower edge shouldn't be less than a, a metre. Loading stations, another example, uh, maybe we have a loading station um, associated with our robot. Um, of course, we need to provide some sort of safeguarding solution to stop the robot process itself, but then we also need to provide additional measures, you know, to prevent this this person from entering the robot cell. There could be a, a, a chance of unexpected startup, for example. Um, so we really talk about 1.4 metres high if you're looking at um, 4024-8801, but 4024-3302, our robot specific type C standard would accept the height of a meter. Um, you know, if you looked at the risk assessment um, and you said, "Hey, um, you know, there's there's not there's not a well that the the person resetting our safeguards has a clear view of the hazardous area. Um, maybe there's there's space within for this person to avoid the hazards. You know, maybe that could be reduced to a meter." <clears throat> 
Um, adaptive, adaptive workspace application. Um, again, we may have this person working within the area and we have a sliding, a sliding guard to change the, um, to change the safety measures within the robot. But in this scenario, you know, this person has a good, a good, um, exit path, although probably not the best, um, as they have to step over this conveyor here. Um, safe robot control. Um, where there is multiple um, operating zones, for example, we can we can monitor and safely monitor the tool center point or monitor the exact position of our tool center point. Um, yeah, the orientation, the speed, the exact position, and doing this, we may need to change the way the robot moves and functions depending on the application. Um, our safeguarding of our tools, grippers, end effectors, um, loss of energy does not cause a release of the load. Um, release of detachable tools only occurs in designated locations. Um, we need to ensure that our tools can ex withstand the expected static and dynamic requirements. If we if we actuate an e-stop, you know, does does the our tool withstand the you know the the, the sudden stopping of all that inertia? Um, tool changing, um, we need to be aware of some requirements for our end effectors or our tool changing. Um, accidental misuse of the tool should not lead to a hazardous situation. Um, Again, the, our tool changing must um, occur in designated locations. We need to ensure that they can withstand the expected static dynamic requirements again. But another one here, monitor tool changing system. So we may want to monitor our, our tools to ensure that we are not changing our, or we're not um, affecting our, maybe our restricted space. Maybe we want to ensure that we pick up the correct tool and we dynamically change the restricted space of our robot. If we don't monitor this, we could pick up a tool that's larger than what we think. We have a um, we have an incorrect restricted space now, um, and maybe our maybe our robot could um, could creep outside of that restricted space, for example, and and hit someone or hit, or contact our safeguarding measures. Teaching robots can be scenarios where there's two people within the safeguarded space. Um, in this scenario, not only does our first person need the teach pendant, um, but the second person needs a, a standalone enabling device. Light curtains, obviously, if we're using these light curtains, we need to ensure that we are um, installing them at a sufficient distance to take into account the stopping time of our robot and our and other systems, including our end effectors as well. Um, but you know you need to take into account the response time of in this instance the light curtain safety PLC cycle time. This is the worst case, so use your worst case or your maximum allowed cycle time if you have a safety PLC. Um, contactors typically not. For our robot application, we we would do well. Sorry, we could be using contactors, um, and the reaction and robot stopping time. So, the manufacturer will give you the data for the worst case stop time for your robot, um, category zero or category one. Um, it'll tell you how how long it will take to stop the robot. Worst case. Um, validation, verification, compliance. Um, again, making sure we use or making sure we 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 verify um, our safety measures and it, and our safety solutions to a proper validation. Um, 
So more information, obviously, you can have a look at our PILS training courses. We are, we are running an online um, industrial robot and collaborative robot course in October. If you are interested, that's a, it's a really good course, that one. A lot of this information, but a two-day course, it's explained. We go into it a lot further, um, practical examples. And some of the documents we reference as well, not only our standards, but our um, compliance codes, codes of practice. Uh, thank you all for attending. Hope you all have a good weekend. And yeah, like I said, we, we're running an industrial robot and collaborative robot course in October, um, reach out if there's any more information you want on that. It's a good course.